Single I Salute, I'm Lord Matre, the hip hop futurist. You're now tuned into the Super Longevity Institute podcast. This e this afternoon, I have a very special guest. She holds a PhD from the University of Plymouth School of Media. She was a filmmaker in residence at the University of Colorado and holds certificates for paralegal studies from the Blackstone School of Law and Nutrition and Sports Training, American Muscle and Fitness Association. She's been called an early adopter of revolutionary changes from Wyatt Magazine in 2000 and a role model for super longevity by the Village Voice in 2001. Her conceptual whole body prototype received international recognition. While her media design works has been honored at Women in Video at the Moscow Film Festival, her most recent scientific research has been a breakthrough within the field of chronics and long-term memory of the simple animal C. elegans. She was invited to the International Sport Accord Convention at St. Petersburg, Russia in 2013 for Olympic and non-Olympic sports talk about human enhancement in sports and introduced the concept of a super Olympics. She is the di- executive director, director of Humanity Plus, an international nonprofit organization, and was the former president of Extra P Institute. She continues to work with academic institutions, nonprofit organizations, and businesses about human futures. University of Advancing Technology, former program champion of graduate studies, she has lectured at Harvard. Yale, Stanford, Virginia Commonwealth, Cambridge, and Hong Kong Universities Sport Foundation, a fellow of the Institute for Ethics and Emergency Emerging Technologies, visiting scholar at 21st Century Medicine, and advises nonprofit organizations including Adaptive AI, Alcor Life Extension. She has been a consultant to IBM on the future of human performance. She is a proponent of human rights, morphological freedom, and currently writing a chapter for Oxford Handbook of Human Symbolic Evolution by Oxford University Press. Ladies and gentlemen, hip-hop futurist, transhumanist worldwide, Dr. Natasha Vidamore. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm a fan of your work. Thank Both you. your musical prowess and your ability to form a, a interesting connectivity between different cultures. So th- thank you very much for your work. Thank you for doing this and taking the time. I'm a big fan of yours. I have the transhumanist, re- the transhumanist reader right here. It was excellent. Excellent book. Thank um, you. Let me just jump in right here, right now. When and why did you become a transhumanist? You know, that's a good question. One, you know, often forgets about the past and and the the stepping stones from getting here to there because we're so caught in the moment or thinking about the future. Mm. But my interest in the uh, transhumanist movement and transhumanism as a philosophy and worldview began actually long before I even heard of the term uh, as a fine artist, which I was in the 1970s, I um, made a lot of uh, performances and videos and, and uh, short films, high eight films, about breaking away from the constraints that hold us back as a species. So that has been uh, fundamental to my work early on. Secondarily, within that realm of understanding, the idea that artists must die before they become well-known always uh, ruffled my feathers and put my teeth on edge. I never thought that one would have to wait to die to be recognized for the value and worth of one's ideas, imagination. And so from the get-go, even as a teenager, I thought that that concept, that understanding of belief system was a misnomer and ought to be repelled and uh, prevented from permeating the whole large world of the arts, from films to music to uh, dance and performance and visual arts, uh, writing, that 
it's not the person who wants to be fam famous. That's beside the point. It's the, the quality of the work and the message that's being put forth. Mm -hmm. So those two uh, particular um, psychological characteristics um, pushed me forward to looking at what possibilities there were outside of the norm for humanity. And in 1981, I started reading about the transhuman. And it was interesting, I was living in Venice, California, and I picked up the uh, LA Reader, which was one of the magazines at the time. Mm -hmm. And on the cover was a picture of FM 2030. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. And I uh, read the article and I picked up the telephone and I called. I would really love to talk to you about your ideas about the future human and the idea of life extension. And um, we agreed to meet over a cup of coffee, which we did. And we became very dear friends. Uh, for many years and worked together for many years because we were driven by that same um, passion that this life could be extended, that the disease that have caused so many troubles and problems and sorrows for humanity didn't have to continue forward, that there would be a day when we would discover the, the cures for all diseases prolong life and reverse aging. So mm -hmm. that's the history of it. And it would, took that one moment of picking up that paper and being proactive and making that phone call that set me in the in the direction towards transhumanism which is far larger than that particular incident or right. and includes that that view right. uh, fundamentally but is right. is far larger wow um i also was reading that you came up with um you wrote a transhumanist manifesto in the 80s i was like wow Dr. Natasha Venomore been down since day one. It's the full yeah, no. time. It's almost embarrassing, I have to tell you. No, that's no, not embarrassing. True. That's great. That's what you know, I, I was like. At we, that, we you know, need, coming from yeah, we, we need, need more We need we need to know this long history. We need we need to be talking to you to get this long history of what transhumanism is about. Because not many people can tell you. Not many. I don't know too many people who. I thought the transhumanist manifesto was written early, and when I found out. You did it in the 80s. I, my mind was blown. I was like, wow. So I didn't well, know. Well, I was so passionate about it. I was, I, I had been uh, performing in Japan. I had been in Switzerland. I had been to the Paris Arts Festival. I had wow. been working really hard in theater and performance art. Wow. And uh, it, it, something wasn't right. Something seemed to be amiss, even though, you know, technology, virtual reality was just starting mm -hmm. to uh, come on board in the early 1980s. And uh, lots of new interesting works with video and digitality and whatnot. Something was missing in the consciousness of the art world. Yeah. And that to me was um, this whole thing going back to the work is more important than the person. Well, yeah, okay. But the person is important. Each life is important. Right. Every single living being has worth right. in, the, in, in the system. Of, of of the world and and it's um uh, homostasis and, and so from that perspective it was writing a manifesto seemed normal it hmm. was not outside the norm and i right. was very involved in the fluxus movement as well so it kind of uh was par for the course um uh, hmm. in that regard yeah 1982 i wrote it i published so, it in wow. 1983 it got on board the cassini huggins spacecraft in the yeah, uh, late 90s it that went to crazy. saturn and crash actually crashed into the rings of saturn with the cassini uh, you know dropped part of its mission um spacecraft and then traveled on but it, it was it was lovely 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 wow, time. that's crazy that what was the so you you must have got a positive feedback from writing this man of um festo not really not re oh wow no because at that time this was way before the internet mm. so in order to get your ideas out you need to have publish it in a book be covered in um a magazine um be on television or in a film and or you know do you know theatrical works which i did do of course mm. um but it was it was before its time most people then were not interested in life extension the movement of self-realization of health and diet and nutrition mm. I know and, exactly what you're um, yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not very many people were interested in life extension at that time. What that was the driving force for me, longevity. longevity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
me myself too um the way i got i came to uh find transhumanism is because my father has parkinson's and i was doing all the research behind i was like i gotta find out what's going on with my pops and so i started and that's how i found out i was like wow so that's how i got to um know about transhumanism um uh, how far back does uh the root of transhuman the idea of the transhumanist go th- how far back in time does that go specifically the it goes back to Allegari dante italian poet um that's my research in the 1980s my mother who was a, a keen intellectual and highly creative person would do a lot of research with me. And we would try to uncover ideas and and where they stemmed from. And we both took a a keen interest in where the word transhuman and the ideas of transhumanism stem from. So uh, again, before the World Wide Web, before the internet of things, we had libraries and there are buildings that you walk into. And you go through the the, the right. Dewey Decimal system and you look for things and right. cross-reference. So we spent a few years researching this and uh, through our, our own means, she was in Northern California and I was in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And we traced it back to uh, the Webster's Dictionary um, long before it was ever known, traced it back to encyclopedias. We traced it back to mm-hmm. um, the works of Allegheny Dante in, um, mm-hmm in his poetry where he used transhumanora, transar, and also T.S. Eliot, um, the uh, poet and more of a, a screen, a writer uh, for plays. And um, in the cocktail party, he uses the phrase transhumanize about a couple that's going through a transformation or a transition. Wow. Uh, other uses of it, but most largely um, attributed to uh, Julian Huxley. But Huxley was friends with T.S. Eliot, mm. and T.S. Eliot used it before Huxley. Mm. And T.S. Eliot also loved the works of Dante. So you can see this thread of, of where the word was used. And it was Huxley that wrote about it as an evolutionary biologist in the 1950s. Mm. But he did not coin the term, I don't think. Uh, he may have used it, uh, but the word was already out there, so it's it's hard to say who really coined it. However, I think he does deserve credit for bringing it into the the evolution of our species, mm-hmm. but not as a philosophy. Mm-hmm. The idea of the philosophy wasn't even created by FM 2030 or FM Esfandiari, who wrote the book, Are You a Transhuman? He was more interested in the Huxleyan view, yes. Um, I mentioned in that book, by the way, but I haven't thought about it for a long time. Mm-hmm. But it's it's interesting because the philosophy actually wasn't written until 1990 by Max Moore. And there was no philosophy before then. There was the concept of the transhuman. There was a, the concept of evolution of human, uh, but there wasn't a philosophy. This is straight. So I'm so glad you brought this up because as a scholar and as an academic, it's really important to me to find the primary sources of information and knowledge and to credit appropriately. And I'm even checking myself to make sure that I do it correctly. So it's it's a good thing to do. Definitely. I'm learning. I learn from you guys. I'm listening. (laughs) I'm listening. (laughs) Transhumanism and religion, these are two separate concepts. Mm -hmm. Um, And why? Because transhumanism is a philosophy and philosophy and religion are in two different um, fields of knowledge. Mm -hmm. The purpose of religion is, and the meaning of religion explains that religion is about worshiping, Mm -hmm. believing in and worshiping a higher power. Mm -hmm. Philosophy is about seeking knowledge about what it means to exist, the fundamentals or epistemology of existence. So on the one hand, it's about worshiping a higher power. On the other hand, with philosophy, it's seeking knowledge about existence, why we're here, what do we do? Now, certainly there are crossovers. Religion does get into philosophy, although it won't admit it largely uh, because there's that schism. But Uh, I think in religion, in most religions that at least I am aware of, want to understand the purposeness of of humanity or the human, why we're here. However, not so with philosophy. Philosophy does not encourage 
or suggest that we worship anything. Right. In fact, worshiping is, um, you know, bowing down to, mm -hmm. and I, I suppose you could say people do worship uh, the like a king or a queen or someone in power and bow down to them. But it's a, that's a different type of worshiping. That's not a superpower. In science fiction, interestingly enough, there's a lot of philosophical lore within uh, Philip K. Dick's work and Davian Broadwood's work and certainly Vera Vinge's work, who coined the term, mm. the technological singularity. Right, right, right. Uh, but we don't worship those those superheroes. We see them as as types of gods of lore, of mm. narratives. Interesting. Um, Backstabs, because I noticed that there are now people um, saying that they're trans Christians and transhumanism. And I know that the Mormons are, they have a, a transhumanist organization, which I thought was dope. I like to see the diversity and what other people are going to bring to the table as far as new ideas to transhumanism. But I, I don't really get, you know, because I'm an atheist myself, um, I don't get the connection between them believing in God and still... Um, claiming the philosophy of transhumanism at the same time. That's the only thing I'm confused about, but I'm very open-minded. You know, I, I find it confusing too, although logically I understand it. Mm. And uh, in brief, I'll just explain my thinking on it, mm. is that you can be a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, a Buddhist, an atheist, an agnostic, and still support the tenets of transhumanism. Right. Within the tenets of transhumanism, or the principles, there is nothing that says you can't uh, worship a higher power. Right. You cannot have a religion. Right. Those That phrasing, that understanding is, is not held within transhum transhumanism. And we did that on purpose, because to fight a world where the, the majority does hold a religious or spiritual view would be a little bit foolish. To include is the more honorable thing to do and more loving thing to do. And that's part of, of, of your philosophy in the, in the hip hop um, manifesto and ideas. So it's, I think that that's a good thing. Um, some of the consequences there about the afterlife, if you are a Christian, for example, and you, you support the idea of an afterlife being heaven, let's say, how would that interfere with living indefinitely or going into cryonics? Mm. And the, the rationale there is going, living indefinitely does not eliminate an afterlife, if that's right. a belief system. Mm -hmm. It just prolongs life until you get to that afterlife. And the same right, with cryonics. The, uh, the conflict that humanity is, has undergone since time immemorial. And these are things that religion hasn't helped and certainly as even added to. So that's the only conundrum I see, not mm. the afterlife or the worshiping of a super um, God or super being. Well, thanks for explaining that because um, a lot of people I know are religious and we always have our um, discussions about these things because they always ask me, well, Matre, how did you get into transhumanism? Do you believe you have a soul? I mean, I get questions all the time. I don't mind. You can quit. I'm a, I'm an open book. You can talk to me. I'm very easy to talk to. You can come. You know, we can kick it. You know, I don't care what religion domination you're from. We can still be friends. We can still talk about um other stuff rather than religion and and stuff like that. But um, I'm glad you mentioned that because I I want people to know that transhumanism is about being a humanitarian. <laughs> so some of that like it's humanitarianism. So I mean, you know, um. I just let me see. Um. Oh yeah, twenty thirty. How did you know? Um. What was he like? Cause he just seems like such an interesting guy. When you see him, he, he has an air of like he has some mystique about him. When you look at him, he just, I was looking at his picture. I said, man, this guy looked very interesting. I would have loved to build with him. I know he taught at the new school, and um, uh, I think uh in the early eighties. So um, and you know, I worked across the street from the new school. I was like, dang, I missed him. Um, I worked at a bookstore called East West Books, and they sold a bunch of metaphysical Ooh. books. They actually, we actually sold Ray Kurzweil books too. Um, that's the first time I seen titles by um Ray Kurzweil is at the bookstore that I worked at. So it was right across the street from the new school. But um, what was he like? 
he was easy to fall in love with. Mm. I, I absolutely adored him. And we were together for about 10 years. And it was um, lovely, mm. challenging, uh, like any relationship. Mm. We uh, enjoyed traveling locally. Mm. Uh, we enjoyed long walks and jogging um, in Santa Monica by the ocean. Mm. We enjoyed putting on events. We had many uh, salons or soirees at his place or my place. Uh, he taught at UCLA and I co-taught some of his classes. Wow. I wasn't faculty there as he was. He was um, in the uh, adult learning session, but I did lecture at his, his classes. Mm. Uh, at times, uh, we shared a lot of ideas and uh, he encouraged me to start my TV show, which I did. And it last, that lasted for about seven years or eight years called Transcentry Update. It aired in Los Angeles. It was shot in Los Angeles wow. on cable and aired in LA and, and in Telluride, Colorado, where I was from. Mm. Uh, okay, so about him. He taught at the New School in the 70s. He moved to Los Angeles shortly after that. And he traveled back and forth from LA to New York. Oh, and um, he was with the Olympics. He did oh, uh, compete in the Olympics. He was with the United Nations. He was... He was following in his father's footsteps um, to start, but then he got interested in fiction and he wrote a number of fiction books that are exquisite to read. And I think you'd really enjoy them. Mm. My favorite is called The Beggar. Mm. Beautiful story. Also The Day of Sacrifice. Mm. And another book that is um, heart wrenching is called Identity Card uh, Fiction and more about the future. And he became a futurist. He fell in love with the idea of the future and he had a nostalgia for the future. And that's when he started getting interested in ideas. A lovely, dignified person. He was exceedingly handsome, uh, incredible charisma, uh, very intelligent and extremely kind to everyone. Of course, there are other issues that we won't go into as every relationship has, but as he was always a friend, people loved him. Well, um. There were, what, what was some, were there other women involved in transhumanism in the 80s when you first yes. wrote the manifesto? At UCLA, there was 50% women. Mm. Um, many of those women um, were very strong futurists. It was before the internet, so not yeah. everyone was posting on Facebook right. or, so yeah. it's, it's kind of hard to say, but yes, there was uh, lots of women involved, but to be honest, I think that what was happening at that time and that drew probably more women into uh, the, the, the fold of postmodernism in mm. academics mm. in the 80s and 90s, and, and it's just loosening its grip today. Mm. And um, the women in transhumanism were more futurists rather mm. than academics. And so there's that, um, and feminist studies actually took more interest for women mm. in academics than transhumanism. Okay. In the, the, the fields of, of science, um, Judith Campisi um, would, would fit into the, the women contributing to the science of longevity. So I think that the idea of transhumanism at that time or early on uh, outside of the sphere of, of the future studies, it was more about computer science and encryption and blockchain and ideas about nanotechnology and artificial intelligence and, and genomics. And that was largely Silicon Valley where Los Angeles, the transhumanists were more in the, in the arts and entertainment, I would say, mm -hmm. or the future. Wow. What was some of the, um, uh, what was your show like when you, um, and uh, when you had your first TV show about, was it was, was it, it was a futurist, transhumanist show? What was that like in the early? Because that's early on. Like I would, I would love to see footage of that. You still have footage I, of that? Yes, oh, I, I do. That. In my right across <laughs> my my study, I have a closet full of of uh, videos, oh, a man. three quarter inch. A lot of it have been put on DVD. Uh, what was it like? My first few shows, I was terrible. 
Mm. I really, uh, I was an embarrassment to myself, I have to mm. say. You know, I look like a, a deer in the headlights. Mm. My first TV shows, I was very nervous. Mm. Wow. But once I got over that, once I started feeling more comfortable in front of the cameras, mm. I enjoyed it enormously. Mm. Being on camera on TV in a studio is much different than being a performance artist or on stage in theater. Mm. And I'd studied theater in Los Angeles for a number of years and did stage work. Mm. And I love being on stage. And that to me was was home or being doing performance art inside the a volcano or the Amazon jungle or sculpting my body into red rocks in you know the amphitheater. Uh, any of those things to me were were wonderful and fun, but being with that camera right on me, I was very nervous. But I got the knack of it, and the the shows um, I think were seminal. They were groundbreaking because I had on um, the the individual who lived in Studio City who created the first electric car. I had him on my show. He invited me to Studio City, and I actually drove it. And this is in the mid nineteen eighties. And uh, I remember sitting in the car, and I said, "Well." how do I turn it on? And he looked at me, I said, no, no, no. Well, where's the ignition? How do I turn it on? He said, it's been on this whole time. It was so quiet. It was like, it, it was like a whisper. Mm. That was fun. I also had on a Robin Hansen, who is an economist. We all know very much. Mm. I had a course on FM was on many of my shows. Um, uh, and then we talked about that. You and him together. Oh, I gotta see that. <laughs> I want to see that. Yeah, oh, I do. I hope to make a documentary at some time with Great. with ideas from the past, present, and future. Um, you and he would have gotten along beautifully. Yeah, I can already tell. Just the fact that he changed his name to FM 2030. I, I was like, yeah, I like that. I was like, wow. Um, what, so you, I did, you did theater also, huh? Wow. Yeah. When I read your, you, you've you've lived a very fascinating, enriching life, like. I was listening to you and Max talk on the future. I think it was the, I'm not sure it was the Futures podcast, but you said you're like, a, you said something about artists of life. And when I read down your bio and I listen to you talk about the things that you've done, you've done so much. You've been, you've done theater. You're, you're like an athlete. You, you were into, um, uh, you know, fitness. You did films. You ran for office. And when I said, when I seen you ran underneath the Green Party, I said, wow. Picture a transhumanist running underneath a green party today. <laughs> I know, boy. Yeah. What made you? And you won. That's the. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, oh let's, well. Let's not forget. She ran underneath the grand green party and won. So you, you, it was counting. Yeah, I right? did. Yeah, I, I, my platform was based on uh, technology to clean up the environment, and I still hold that same value today. And I think it's the only way to clean up the environment, mm. and the um. Most of the Greens were saying, you know, stop technology um, in that like a salvo of Bill Joy. You know, let's go back to the villages and uh, right. horses and, you know, carriages. You, you can't do that. Yeah, that's yeah. ridiculous. You can never and, yeah. yeah. After you have a refrigerator, you, will, you, you don't want to live without one or stove. Yeah, you don't want to fucking device. Be taking wood I mean, and trying to make fire. Silly. But I think that that my platform and, and what what I stood for really touched people, and they agreed, and that's why I won the election. Cool. And um, I served. I didn't serve my full term. I resigned after a year because of the insider fighting, which I just yeah, do not right. like, and I don't want to be a part of. Yeah, you would never run again for office. Yes, I would. <sighs> yeah, I was thinking about a Senate uh, seat do. here in Arizona. Um, <sighs> But I wanted to finish a uh, full-time teaching. And I also, because of the conflict between the, the two-party system that we have, I can't, with, with good conscience, be a part of either party as it stands right, now. Definitely. I would have to go as an independent. And mm. independent, you pretty much lost the election. So then it, mm. what's the point? No, so no, no, no. Didn't it... Um... What's that guy's name? Didn't Bloomberg run underneath? Un, in the, did he run independent one time? Did I think so. He ran, mm -hmm. he ran independent. I think he won. Didn't he? I could have sworn. I that. think not, that. I have to double really, check that. Because I know. I don't, I'm sure. He, I, I, I have to check that. But um, it's never know. You won the first time. I think you could run again. But um, so um, you did a um pro a design for a future body, like a prototype 
for mm-hmm. how a future body would look like. What type of technologies would, would go into that? What like what was that design about? What was some of the technologies to use to um uh what would the future technologies would that would go in to the uh, prototype? Mm-hmm. Sure. I the reason why I designed and innovated this future whole body prosthetic as a prototype was because I really felt deeply for people who were wheelchair bound, uh, didn't have full use of their arms or legs, or um, if they did have prosthetic parts, they were usually quite unattractive, lacking in aesthetic design. And I remember in many of my long walks in Santa Monica uh, at Palisades Park there, um, seeing a young woman put, being in um, sh- in a this um, like scooter thing. She I don't know if she oh. had cerebral palsy or, or, or polio, whatever it was, but with her parents and um, and seeing children um, suffering. So or you know looking at the people coming back from the different wars. And I, as a teenager, I spent considerable time working with um, individuals with illnesses and deformities. So it was always on my mind that there had, what if we could have another body? Mm. What would that body look like? And uh, so finally, the idea came to fruition. And I remember I was living Marina Del Rey and I was with a couple of friends and I said, what if we could have different bodies? What if there was the the science and technology got to a point where if this body gives up, there's no longer usable, we get another body. And I built a team. I had the idea. I did the sketch for it, came up with the, the um, basic outline for it, written outline for it. And then I built my, my team of experts, which I think is always the good thing to do. I had Marvin Minsky for artificial intelligence, mm-hmm. Peter Voss for artificial intelligence, uh, Eric Drexler for nanotechnology, Robert Friedis for nanomedicine, mm-hmm. Greg Fay for the metabrain, um, which would uh, deal with um, much like Neuralink uh, mm-hmm. is today. Um, and Robin Hansen, um, economists. Uh, you know, I had my team really the the primary sources in their fields. I wanted the experts. And I, I said, be honest with me. If you see where I'm not doing something that makes sense or I'm going a little bit too far in one direction, another, bring me back. Right. You know, check on me, make sure. Um, and give me your, your critique. And as you know, in the art world, we critique. Right. Giving criticism is not a bad thing. Right. It's a good thing. You That's want right. people to say, hey, Definitely. pay attention here. You know, cross that T. I mean, yeah. dot that I. Cross that T. Right. Um, you know, get, get your uh, references as accurate as possible. And so um, we know that, and it's it's again a good thing. So critiquing criticism is the best way to double check yourself and the value and the integrity of your own work, mm. and how people perceive you. So with my team. Um, in place, I started, you know, chiseling away at the idea and I came up with a whole body prosthetic. Um, Mm -hmm. it would be driven by, um, uh, nanotechnology and um, some genetic engineering, not so much because by that time we won't need, um, uh, genetic engineering. Mm -hmm. I looked at the brain, um, called it the meta brain, a term that Greg Fay, uh, came up with equally as Max Moore did uh, mm. separately. And the meta brain was an attachment to, would be an attachment to our, our uh, frontal lobe as a tertiary or a third brain to better uh, assist our memory, our, our replay, our mm. assessment, um, uh, awareness. And it would also have an assistant uh, that would help be like a best friend guiding us and, and helping us make you know decisions and you know checking us if we're doing something that might damage us later on, like fibbing or exaggerating, you know, you know, taking us to task on that. So it was a really cool thing. The design of it, I did in uh, Pixar. I remember going to Seagraph. It was the first Seagraph. It was held in Los Angeles at the convention center. And I purchased the software Pixar, which was the first 3D 
design software. You know, Pixar mm -hmm. today is right, right. one of the leading animators mm -hmm. for incredible films. Yeah, so the, the early Pixar that was fun, I taught myself how to use it and I designed uh, Primo Post Human is what the whole body prosthetic was called. Um, in Pixar as just a shape, it didn't have gender. You could change gender. Oh, wow. um, the skin would be um, change color, tone, texture. Uh, the inner organs would have a grid, uh, a constant communication system with the, the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system to the what I call the exo peripheral nervous system, which is the, the digitality outside our, 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 mm -hmm. our bodies and uploading, downloading, cross-loading with the metabrain. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is just one body and it wouldn't mean that you'd have to be an upload and exist um, totally in cyberspace or, or in computational systems. You could download, cross-load, be in this reality in a game and, and second life and wow. you know, the metaverse, wherever. And um, the, uh, it, the idea actually got covered by I, I can't remember which magazine picked it up first. It could have been Wired or the New York Times, but it. Wow. I'm looking at my study. I was on the cover of magazines all over the world. Wow. Brazil, Turkey, um, Finland, wow. Norway, um, England, of course, France, uh, Germany. I mean, it just, it was wow. amazing. Uh, that idea and today can, continues to be a solid idea and What's interesting, and this is beautiful, that the vision I had for the future of prosthetics mm. to include robotics and artificial intelligence is now here. Right. Take a look at the people who have prosthetic legs and arms that are beautifully mm. designed. I mean, they're just gorgeous. Mm. And of course, they aren't perfect, mm -hmm. um, but we don't want perfection. We want to go towards getting better and better. That's right. And, but at least the the designs and the aesthetics of prosthetics has made incredible leaps and strides in making the uncomfortableness of losing a limb mm. something that is not so daunting, perhaps something that is almost like here, look. And when I see people walking around with showing their prosthetic limbs, their arms or their legs or whatever part of their torso. Um, and not hiding it like they used to do in the yeah. 50s, 60s, and 70s. It's it's quite amazing. It, it sure is. And um, I really identify with that because I have a really good friend um, who lost some fingers. He lost a couple of fingers. This guy's just a great friend, just a great person overall. And I always think to myself, this has happened recently, and I'm always thinking to myself, can he regrow it back? Or can he get us some artificial fingers or something? I'm like, there must be some sign. Mm -hmm. Some, time, some scientists really pushing the envelope in this field. And that's going to be my next level of, I'm going to do my research on that because um, uh, I know that they can do all types of things. Like I, I was listening to you the other day talk about how, you know, you can have artificial limbs and feel the heat, feel mm -hmm. the, you know, feel the heat of the cup with those artificial limbs. And so there's a great connection mm -hmm. with the neural links in your brain to whatever artificial prosthetic part that you may have. And I was just like, that's, that's right. amazing if they can, if you can have an artificial limb and feel, feel the, um, you know, have that type of feedback from the environment. I was like, this is crazy. So um, I'm really looking into that for my friend um, uh, who lost his fingers. Like, uh, I think this happened two months ago in a car accident. Mm -hmm. But um, I have a, another question. And there's a reason why I'm asking this question. People mm -hmm. are going to like this. Who's listening? I know what my audience are into. Explain the early European alchemists of the 13th century and their search of the philosopher's stone as a precursor to today's transhuman, transhumanism. Because I read that in a transhumanist reader. I was like, really? I was like, that's incredible that the way you put that, that connection together from the past. I was like, wow, I don't think nobody would even put that together, <laughs> make that connection. You know, it's it's interesting. The the idea of metallurgy and transmutation of matter is you know something we think about with molecular manufacturing, with the future of nanotechnology. Mm -hmm. But consider that it was the precursor to the field of chemistry. Right. And then we go, wow, wait a minute, this is fascinating. Yes, the early Taoists, of course, Taoists, you know, yeah. and then we have the Egyptians. Yeah. But it was the alchemists in the 13th century. Um, 
1400s that really took it to task and developed the field of alchemy. Mm. And they aimed to transform matter. Now, alchemy is a fascinating field. And at first, it was disregarded mm. by uh, the scholars. But it stems back to Aristotle. Aristotle talked about transmutation of matter. Mm. And later, during the time of the alchemists, they were again, early scientists, but not highly respected mm -hmm. until later. And then Francis Bacon really took that, that field into the sciences and paid homage to the early alchemists. However, some of the alchemy, of course, was not all um, you know, roses and, and positivity. Mm -hmm. There were as, as many snake oil salespeople at that time as there are today. Yeah. And alchemy, um, the concept of, of transforming matter is, is something that we know as essential to our lives today. We're constantly changing matter and the future holds even far more advances exponentially in transmuting matter, especially when we're looking about the, the world and pollution and population and whatnot. When we're mm. thinking about people getting things that they need to survive, right. like housing or medicine or clean water, uh, food, nutrition, any of these elements can be produced through molecular manufacturing later on. So hopefully there will be a day in the future where that concept, the early concept of the alchemists will come to fruition through molecular manufacturing, where the idea of abundance will not be abundance, you know, like huge stuff everywhere, but right. people getting their basic needs met. And that shouldn't be uh, a long shot. That should be something that that is fundamental to us as as humans in right. taking care of other humans yeah, and, totally and life forms. I totally agree because, um, and you know, you jumped ahead, Nata Dr. Natasha, because I was going to ask you, well, you know, transhumanism is a, so, it seems so futuristic. What is the problems they could solve today? And you kind of just already, <laughs> you already <laughs> answered it, which is great. So, um, I th no, but I'd like to add to that. I think one oh, of the, the big problems that we face today is yeah. not with technology or medicine or any of the, the, the fields that deal with life extension or longevity, I think it deals with our consciousness. Mm. And I think that one of the biggest issues that we're facing today is our, our own, um, we as a, a species, let's say, we as humanity. So uh, this doesn't include everyone. Not everyone's doing it. Right. Um, some are doing it more than others, but we each play a part in it because we're part of the system. Right. And because we're part of the system, we are naturally responsible. And it's our responsibility to put a lid on it. And putting a lid on it is not an easy thing to do. It's refusing to participate in the hate speech, mm. not um, messing with knowledge, not mm. trying to rewrite information or erase information, mm. being respectful of the original ideas and seeing how they've grown and developed over the years and add to them and right. push them forward. Effort that maybe transhumanists could do today is to help um, balance out um, what, what might be um, practical optimism, show a way that we can be in the world, create a better world through talking about it, visualizing, writing about it, um, seeing it and explaining it in simple terms and not pushing people to adapt or adopt it. I think that when people are pushed yeah, to true. adopting something, then they're automatically they automatically assume that they're being considered wrong, and no one is wrong. We all learn at our own pace, mm. and being mindful of this and kind to people in their their learning along That's the true. way is is something that we all need to learn um, the vernacular of the language of, and mm. um, you know just because you know someone may um, want to die. I shouldn't dislike them or criticize them that's because true. they want to die. That's their choice. That... I think that the next step in transhumanism, what we need to do is pull away from this politicizing of ideas and get more into the, the, um, the essence, the spirit of the ideas. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because, you know, people come to me all the time saying, but John, I want to live that long. Anyway, I said, you know what? That's your choice. I just, my only issue is 
please don't get in the way of me wanting to live long. <laughs> um, there's there's certain areas no to hate speech and no to don't push your views on on us. Yeah, Dr. Natasha Villanueva. Um, that really, the, you know, that research would have helped my father. So when I hear it, I get a little. Uh, I I can't help but be like, they got, people gotta wake up. We we have to wake up because um I know that uh that type of research would help with pro probably help with my father with Parkinson's and um a lot of other people facing other uh um genetic inherited diseases. Um, yeah, yeah. So um you knew uh, speaking of that Roy Wolford who I have in many of his books not at this library but um. He was into uh, calorie restriction, correct? He was, he was a big yes. component of calorie um, restriction, but he passed away and he had ALS. And I was reading, we were talking about how mm -hmm. he would have possibly been able to, um, that would have helped him also. And yes, definitely. Stem cells uh, could have helped him, not for sure, because there's still a lot right. unknown about ALS and he, and he had it in the, in the you know, 90s. Um, but... Roy Walford, an amazing scientist, um, mm -hmm. and his work on caloric restriction or calorie restriction, CR, is adopted by many people. Um, it's not not something I practice, mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, I I think that for those who want to practice it, that's that's great. Roy um, was not a thin person. He went to the gym. In fact, we would work out at the gym together. We would go to, you know, World Gym run owned by Joe Gold, who started Gold Gym. Oh, he sold the, the Gold Gym um, business to another company. And then he went on and started uh, World Gym. And uh, I worked out there. Max worked out there. Roy did. And so did Arnold Schwarzenegger. In fact, I've worked out with Arnold Schwarzenegger, which is kind wow. of fun. But yeah. Wow. Wow. Um so uh you um oh i want to touch on this this is important um okay <laughs> morphological freedom is a great um uh, uh i love the uh, uh the idea of morphological freedom i think it's very important especially in it it's going to become even more important in the future um can you explain to my audience who might not understand what morphological freedom is Certainly. Morphological freedom is a right to alter, enhance, augment your body and the right to never be coerced to augment, enhance your body. Great. So it's in politics and in law, it's a negative right, but that confuses a lot of people. So let's stay away from that and just look at it as a, a human right, right that you own your body. Right. And within your body is your brain, and within your brain is your mind. Mm. And some consider that to be the the host or the or the the home of your spirit or soul. Others not. It's up to each person's belief system for their morality. However, we must own our thoughts, our ideas, our identity, and as well as our bodies to be able to do what we want with them, as long as we don't damage or hurt anyone else. Likewise, a person should never ever be coerced to or influenced to alter their body to do any type of enhancement or augmentation or therapy if it's not what they want to do That's right. and so then we get into the issue of vaccination and this is where it becomes a, a social issue while morphological freedom protects people and it's one of my my favorite um concepts that came out of transhumanism uh However, we have to consider some other issues here that, that could be outliers for this. An outlier, mm -hmm. could, the, the, the recent situation with the COVID-19 and vaccinations. Mm -hmm. Should employers force their employees to take the vaccine if they mm -hmm. don't want to? And because of the, the confusion about vaccines and um, uh, uh, Asperger syndrome or autism, mm -hmm. which was hightailed and promoted by um, an actress, which was not proven, which was false information. And perhaps her son could have gotten autism from a, a vaccination, but there, it's not conclusive. Right. He could have been, uh, you know, that could have been just his genetic makeup that, right. that added to it. So it was not proven in any way, shape or form scientifically. 
through evidence that, it, that, that there's a correlation, but people still believe there is because social mob and social hysteria often speaks louder than, than, um, than the facts. So I think that morphological freedom, as you said, is going to become ever more important to us as we look at genetic engineering and uploading and downloading and cross-loading and whole body prosthetics and reversing aging and all the sciences and technologies that most of us have been talking about for 30, 40 years. Hmm. They are still coming to fruition. They're still not here completely and, and flawlessly. There are still many dangers with um, therapies and uh, so we have to be very careful. Again, mm. not everyone's going to react to a vitamin the same way, and not everyone is going to react to a therapy or stem cells, uh, genetic engineering, and um, any type of enhancement the same way. So while morphological freedom protects both sides, there is a third element here, and that mm. is common sense. For one to know one's body and to, to be as knowledgeable as much about your own physiology. Right. Well, well, knowing thyself is definitely a key component in a lot of things. Um, I think that w what I gather from people in the hospital when I talk to them about taking a vaccination, because I like to know what pe what's on people's minds. Um, a, a lot of the fear stems from um, people, you know, when, I, when, we, when I'm talking and we having discussions about trust and it's mm -hmm. and, you know trusting people to put this vaccination in they always go back to people like Hen henrietta lax i think the lady's name is henrietta lax yeah. people they go mm -hmm. back to uh things like the tuskegee airmen experiment when they shot them the brothers with the syphilis and stuff like that so you know when we, in, in this society i think that we have a lot of things to heal from especially from the past but i think that when you have a capitalist system like this and and you know you you see that the bottom line is money it kind of breeds a little distrust because you know and and a lot of people so i think that's part of the reason why people don't trust the vaccination i just told them look let me get an itemized let me get the itemized ingredients how how long it take me i'm gonna act i'm gonna read every piece of thing that father said and then i'll make my decision but i definitely needed that itemized list to make my decision before I went ahead and did my own research, I was like, let me get, and they gave it to me. So there he is. You know, it's interesting. Um, there's a difference between capitalism as an economic um, practice and free markets as an economic practice. Mm -hmm. And the, the social uh, misconstruence of capitalism as a, um, a negative uh, way of people, a, a negative means for people to become greedy. Mm. And in that sense, I think that it's the greed and the, um, I guess it's just, you'd have to just say greed of people that falsify information and market their product as being um, uh, safe and practical to use. Mm. So it's not capitalism mm. um it's people right and right. capitalism is really if we so if we just talk about free markets as a as a uh, a way of practicing economics mm. or an economic system free markets is much better than non-free markets and safer in regard to your argument because in a free market system there's competition right Right. And with competition, you will have more openness, more open source, more information available, mm. and people be able to identify and expose where false information is right. and do it better. So if you don't have a free market system, then you have what would be maybe a socialist system. And in not all, but in some socialist systems, there is only one way, and that's the government's way. Right. And if the government is not diverse, then you're going to have, like we had with the, um, you know, the bioethics committee and the Beyond Therapy report, they mm. were all of one mind. They all had the same background, religion, and belief, and morality. And they used their morality to write out an ethical platform. And you cannot mix morals and ethics. Morals are yours. They're who you are. They're your right to have. It's your belief system based on your experiences. Right. Ethics 
is more of a policy. It's a practice. It must have legal interpretations and must be uh, presented in legal ways that have how you practice ethics. But how you practice your own morals is up to you. And then, mm. you know, and morphological freedom. Point. Touch no, that. I see yeah. your point. And I heard Bill Falone talk about um, free market systems can correct things in the marketplace mm -hmm. as far as like medicine and stuff. I, I've heard, I know I've heard him say that, or I've, I've read it somewhere in his books. He talks about that because he talks about the relationship of, um, you know, uh, uh, politicizing um, medicine and mm -hmm. you know, the government owning, you know, the you know, uh, mm -hmm. being in control of medicine and uh, how the free market system is probably it will be a better solution in order for uh, the progression of getting the best medicine out to the public. But yeah, thanks for, thank you for yeah, explaining that. I think that. so. Hmm? I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right there. Hmm. But I think along with that, we still need that transhumanist um, um, practical optimism and sensibility hmm. that, that identifies where the bullshit is. We need to be really smart BS detectors. And, mm -hmm. and with my students in my ethics classes and also in my innovation and business classes that I taught, I would say you've got to be great BS detectors mm -hmm. because if someone's trying to sell you a product and they don't won't tell you their resources or won't tell you where, you know, if they don't have any um, papers written or books published or, um, you know, information readily available and if they get angry at you for asking then right. there's a problem there that's a that's a red flag and pay attention and businesses that will not show you their taxes there's a problem mm -hmm. and um businesses that will not um i'm not talking about sharing trademark or patented information right. by any stretch i'm just talking about an an openness and understanding i think that all of society in the developed world and and probably edging into the 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 newly developing and growing worlds, this, this, the human nature of greed is endemic to our species. Mm. It's, and it's not like, oh, she's greedy or he's greedy and I'm not. We all have a level of greed. Yeah. So what is that? Why do we want to make sure we get our piece of the pie? Mm. Because we're afraid someone else is going to take it. To invest in longevity, that's great. That's mm. wonderful. We need more research. We need more development. We need more tests. We need more, more of more of more. Because none of us want to continue aging and and be prone to diseases such as this pandemic. It's it's a frightening wake up call and a slap oh. in the face to all of us. Yeah. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we're not over marketing snake oil. Yep. And um, you know, it, it, you, I watch a lot of YouTube and and I do a lot of studying to you know, see what's going on out there, and how many followers you have, you know, makes you important. Yeah, Man, it's, true. it's like, what, well, who are your followers? Right. Well, so-and-so has, you know, thousands or millions of followers. Well, who are the followers? I'd rather have five really, I'd rather Me too. Martine Rothblatt, Max Moore, Andrew Sandberg, and Ray Kurtz will follow me. Yeah. Then have a million followers. I totally agree. <laughs> I, I just was talking about this. I was talking, I said, you know, I don't really care, you know, because you know, you hear people bragging about how many subscriptions they have, and I, I'm just happy to have people I can talk to, that I can learn from, and um, if you know, you know, and um, maybe expose some other people to the people that I learn from. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, and then you're 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 play. I I don't say paying it for it because that sounds capitalistic or greedy. I play it forward. You're sharing your knowledge, your yeah. information, and how lovely is that? It's like Gary Snyder, the poet of the beat generation, when he said, you know, the creative minds, the imagine, the imaginary minds listen and watch and they pick off the top of ideas and then they reform them together and then they put it back out there for them to, to spread and sprout new ideas. And how wonderful is that? So, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, because, you know, the... I work in hospice and, you know, I just know that living is the best thing. I I can be happy with a dollar in my pocket. I see so many. Cause I've seen so many. No. I've seen so much in the in house. I've seen so much. Oh gosh. So much. I talk to the families, I talk to the patients. I see so much. So I just you know, people you know, as long as I'm eating, I have a I have shelter, I have the clothes on my back, I can travel here and there once on the blue moon, I'm good. 
and I can just read, if I can get books, you know, if I can keep buying books, because I love books, I'm good. And that's another reason why I did the Super Long Journey Institute, because I wanted to, you know, people... I don't want people to think that I'm just coming out. I, I want people to read. That's how you commu- That's how you know you get exposed to other ideas if you just read. And I just wanted the people to see where some of these ideas came from. And that's why I was sharing the books that I read in the beginning. In the beginning, of you, I showed you all the books that I've read. So then people can go to those books themselves and they'll probably get something else out of it that I didn't. So, mm-hmm. um, oh, let me see. Mm. Oh, do you, how? When do you think we will be able to extend the lifespan? I'm not even talking about thousand years. Just, can I get ten, fifty, maybe twenty years? When can I get? When can? When can? When is that? When the technology will be available? What? What potential technologies will probably put us ten and twenty years extra? Give us twenty, ten, twenty years extra lifespan. The sciences and technologies that will probably give us that extra 10, 20 years beyond our maximum lifespan of 122, 123 years approximately in good health will probably be nanomedicine. CRISPR has done some magnificent advances. So that's CRISPR is is on the forefront there. Mm -hmm. Stem cells help prolong. Uh, And if we could use stem cells in our whole bodies to regenerate, that would be fantastic. But the bottom line here is we're vulnerable. Nonetheless, we're still biological animals. And as biological animals, we're prone to um, viruses and bacteria and uh, mutations, cellular mutations, which could be damaging to us. So using practical optimism and a little bit of sensibility, it seems reasonable that we would want to prolong our bodies through nanomedicine and the other therapies that that could help us and, and diet nutrition, of course, but also to be considering alternative bodies be available to us because even if you did everything you could possibly do and you were right at the, at the forefront of every new therapy available, there's still the issue that you could get hit by a truck. Mm. So now you know I have two dogs. They're both golden doodles. One is golden, the other is black. One is named Huxley Mm -hmm. in honor of Julian Huxley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the other is Dante in honor of Allegheny Dante. Wow. How long have you had them? uh, Huxley is four years old. And Dante is, he'll be eight months soon. Wow. And they're they're big boys. Mm. Huxley weighs seventy seven pounds. He's wow. a, a large golden doodle, and Dante weighs seventy. He's still a puppy, but he's a big boy. Wow. Okay. What is what is my what like? What is your diet like? What is my diet like? I pretty much eat um, protein, lots of vegetables. I make sure I get my greens. I love kale. Uh, I love um, steak and a baked potato. I love everything, but I make sure that I, I eat within reason, that um, I don't fill up totally full at each meal, and I try to eat fresh food, and both Max and I love cooking, so um, we enjoy treating each other. Basically, our diet is is paleo. Ah, I'm not surprised you said that. And you, yeah, yeah, paleo is the, I think paleo is the way to go. <laughs> I don't know. I think, I, I surely do. And um, do you do any like meditation, yoga practices or anything oh, yeah. like that? I started meditating when I was 18 years old. Uh, my brother gave me the, the series of training as a gift mm-hmm. because I had lots of anxiety my freshman year at university. Mm-hmm. I wanted to go to Pratt mm-hmm. in Rhode Island or mm-hmm. and be close to New York where the museums were mm-hmm. and I was born. Uh, but I was stuck in Memphis and... Um, I was unhappy and had anxiety. And Mm. so I started doing transcendental meditation. I still do it today. I think TM or transcendental meditation is a very smart practice. Mm. However, I think any type of meditation is good. Certainly Shakti Gawan, who Mm. I studied her work is about creative visualization. So I combine creative visualization. Yeah. You know what? Yeah, it's so good to say that because I don't have that book at this library, but I haven't heard that that name and that title in years. 
Yeah, that book is really that, that I've read that book I, years, like I 20 love years that ago. book. It's a great book. So you envision it. Envision what you want what you want to be. Envision mm-hmm. what you want to look like. Envision how you want it to be. Mm-hmm. And then you train yourself to go in that direction. But you gotta mm-hmm. see it first. It's like any business. You create your business plan and you have your goal. You create your vision statement, your mission, your mission statement. And you have your your goals and your end point. You want to reach your end point. Mm. So with Shakti Gawan, she had you do creative visualization, yeah. and I loved it. Yeah, wow. Now I'm, you're gonna make me go back and get because it's not at this spot. I'm gonna go back. They've been telling me, what you, why you don't? Why you keep leaving your books over here? I have so many other that library in that library. That's where I have that type of those type of books, and I have that book. I'm gonna go back and get it. I have to reread that book. I think mm-hmm. I need to reread because it, it keeps coming back up. I'm gonna go get that. Thank you. Thank you for that. You're welcome. I'm surprised you even mentioned that. You just you just shocked me just now. Because <laughs> as a transhumanist, you don't think you don't know. You know, I have all these friends that's into these type of things, creative visualization, and, and they into yoga and stuff. They say, "Matre, are they? Are you transhumanist friends into that?" See, the top Dr. Oh Natasha did it more right. I studied yoga with Bikram for three and a half years in Beverly oh. Hills at the Yoga College of India. Yeah, yeah. I wrote a book that's me on the cover there, right wow. here. Wow. Uh, it's called uh, One on One Fitness. Mm. I wrote this in with my friend Lee. Mm. She was a top model um, and actor in many TV shows and films. Wow. And yeah. So, this is pretty diesel too. I was watching. I said, I said "Look at me!" So y'all both work out. That's me. Wow. And so, yeah, I taught yoga in Santa Monica. Wow. Um, and I studied it for years. I still practice it. Mm. Raquel Welsh was in my class. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, it's I love yoga. Well, thanks it's for great. sharing that because you know we we're a diverse group. Everybody, you know we we. There's a lot of acad- um, people in the academic world, but, you know, um, that doesn't mean they exist in a bubble. They do other stuff, fitness, they're into taking care of themselves. You know, it's not they're not just living in their head. I just wanted to, because no, I'm getting hit up all the time. They don't have a soul betrayal. Do you have a soul? You know, my friends say, you don't feel like you have a soul betrayal? Because they didn't really, you know, they know me from when I used to work at this bookstore and I was very into metaphysics. I'm not, a, I'm no long, not in the same I would, I don't want to say I'm not into metaphysics anymore, but I'm not into metaphysics like I was in the past. Like it's more, I don't, you know, transhumanism is all I really need. It fulfilled all those needs that I had when I was a when I when I was into that type of um thing. When I was into metaphysics, which I'm even, I agree. You know, I agree. So it fulfilled it does all of those too. needs now. You know, I I don't you know, so you know I'm not. You know, my friend said you don't believe in traveling through the astral. I said no. I mean, I got virtual. We're gonna have virtual reality. You know, we can do all of that. We, you know, we're gonna have different bodies across different substrates. So we, you know, we, right. We, right? Am I right? And um, and I know Ray Kurzweil is a lucid dreamer. He's a deep. You know, you can uh, fulfill all of those. And if you're if you're great at lucid dreaming, you know, you you know, you probably can do. You know, uh, get that type of same effect as astral travel that you talk about in lucid dreaming. Yep. You know, so um, but um, oh, the Super Olympics. That's what I wanted. That's what I wanted. I was like, wow, that, wouldn't that be great? A transhumanist Super Olympics. What would that look like? Like, what would what, what would be some of the competitions for that? You know, it's so funny because FM and oh, I used to talk about this. Mm. Um, what if we could? And I I did some illustrations uh, years ago. What if we could skate on the rings of Saturn? What if we could do solar, you know, solar panel, um, uh, like uh, when you do windsurfing mm. on a lake? What mm. if we could do solar surfing? Mm. Uh, I see Olympics out into space as being, you know, incredible. What if we had Olympics on the moon? You mm. know, how would the athletes deal with that, that the, the, the difference in the gravitational field? Mm. What are some of the things that we could do in space? And I think that... It makes sense that the Olympics will go into space um, mm, that would be when crazy. the time is right. Yeah, mm, that would be uh, that would be amazing. You know that um, hip hop is now in the Olympics as a they're entering. They're doing a breaking competition, which I was like, wow. Oh, I yeah. love that. Yeah, they're gonna be doing it because you know uh, breaking uh, is all over the world. It's practiced 
by every, like everyone, every coach all over the world has a breaking team now, even Korea. So, wow, you know, when I, yeah. So um, when you said Super Olympics, I was like, wow, what if I was like, that would be so amazing. I would love breaking to see in a space. Dance. I would love to see that. Um, let's see. Oh, I noticed that transhumanists are moving away from the word immortality to explain radical life extension. Do you know how Robert Ed Ettinger viewed this subject? I never knew Robert Ettinger. He was mm. before my time, but um, I, I, no, I don't. Yeah, I, no, I, I don't. I, Historically, in fiction, the term immortality was pretty much aligned with um, a nonsensical future, something that mm. was not achievable kind of like the the pill of immortality um and i think that even the concept of immortality is far too close to the concept of perfection right. to be um authentic perfection means as you know you get to a point where there's nothing else you do you're perfect mm. no place to go well i certainly don't want to be perfect I don't think a world of perfection is what we want. I think we want to continue growing and learning and exploring and exchanging and, and creating and inventing and, you know, envisioning. Mm. So to me, perfection means stasis. Mm. So when people say to me, you just want to be perfect, I go, oh, no, I don't. Right. I just want to keep on learning and growing and improving right. and exploring. So the concept of immortality, I feel the same way it touches me the same way mm. if you're mortal there's no way back mm. and i attribute that feeling that i have to jean paul sartre's play no exit where mm. you have three people who are sequestered to hell and they're stuck in a room with no windows and no doors for eternity for immortality mm. and when i think of immortality it means you can't you don't ever change it's that but I see a future is continually changing. And I think what we know today, we'll look at 100, 200 years from now and go, wow, that was interesting that they thought that. Mm. They were onto some really smart things. Oops, not, not so much over here, but wow, great ideas over there. Mm. So I think that immortality sounds too authoritarian. We all face things that are hurtful and painful and sorrowful mm. and lovely and beautiful and enriching. And I think if we could remove a lot of the pain that humanity faces mm -hmm. and assuage some goodness and some hope in there and to uh, appreciate life as, as valuable, every moment we're alive, we're alive mm -hmm. is so extremely valuable and to be cherished. That to me is what we're aiming for. Mm -hmm. When people talk about immortality, they sound a little bit uppity, perhaps, mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, yeah, I see what you're saying. You know, it's it's hard to. Yeah, I didn't I, think about I, it I, in that way, but I, I, now that you're bringing it up, I, I I see what you mean by that. I I see how if somebody didn't weren't they weren't they didn't know anything about transhumanism and you start coming around talking about immortality. For first of all, people think you're crazy, but then after that, after they. After that, who's they'll be like, what? This, this a person? This is, this is kind of uppity. It's like it's, it seems elitist. Yeah. It seems it has an elitist yeah. type of tone to it, right? I'm gonna be a yeah, it, it it does, but not in a good way. Like yeah. I I support high art. I've always right. been involved in high art, right? Uh, like David Bowie, yes. yeah, high art, David. yeah. But to me, someone who's talking about immortality is not high art. To me, mm. it's someone who is like. Uh, um, it's someone who's trying to sell snake oil mm. and, and there is, even if we do conquer death, which I hope we do. Mm. And I think in the future we will as a species, I don't think we're going to want to be quote unquote immortal as biological beings. I think right. we're going to want to expand and explore beyond our biology mm. and explore beyond the planet and, you know, look at all sorts of possibilities in the thousands of years ahead. But if you say, I want to be immortal, the, the, the connotation is, the message that is being sent is, I'm going to be just like I am as Natasha right now forever, this. Mm. And, mm. 
and that's a bad message. Mm. Be and it also makes people go, well, what about overpopulation? And, yeah. and you know, aren't you selfish? And you don't care about anyone else. And yeah. But if we talk about longevity or the phrase, I created radical life extension, then I think that we're looking at longevity is is staying alive mm. and radical life extension brings in the ideas of looking at radical life extension meaning using certain technologies like nanotechnology genetic mm. engineering stem cells reversing aging all these things and cognitively backing up our minds our brains um you know altering our our memory um existing coexisting in in multiple substrates i think that is more of an attainable future mm. especially in the culture of gamers so many people are gamers today yes, and yes. gamers understand what it's like to to coexist in another substrate yeah. they live in a virtual game and they play in a virtual game and they it's it's reality it's it's a reality for mm. them so i think making that connection between gaming and living longer in a different substrate with mm. as an avatar body or you know but not exclusively to also live within the biological body so that there are, it's not binary life. Oh, and yes. what we're, we, we have today, a binary system, right. you're, you're alive or you're dead. Mm -hmm. I think that that binary system is a thing of the past mm -hmm. and we have a, a diverse uh, system that is non-binary. Wow. Um, what would get us there to uh, be able to exist in different substrates? Cause that seemed like a really difficult task. Like I, I was looking at carbon copies the other day and, um, you know, he said something I was, I, you know, he's I, Dr. Cohen, I think his name is, did I say his name? Right? Randall, yeah. Randall, he said yeah. something about, um, there's a difference between mind uploading and brain, whole brain emulation, emu, emulation. And I was like, you know what? You know, I, I said that, I thought that was really, um, interesting. He said, he's not using the word uploading anymore because it's, it's kind of misleading whole brain emulation mm. to represent his work as a neuroscientist mm. and looking at transferring and copying what the brain does, the functionality of the brain, which right. is the mind. Uploading stems largely from science fiction, right. where like William Gibson, different authors mm. talked about uploading into cyberspace. Uh, they're really the same thing. There is slight distinction. So in all due respect to Randall and his work and coining the phrase whole brain emulation, mm. there is a slight difference in how they're interpreted. Mm. However, there is in actuality differences in the modalities of the methodologies in achieving that end, whether the brain is transferred uh, digitally, whether the neurons, the functions of the neurons and the dendrites and the synapses or the electrical charges are copied over, how it's done, that is a matter of process and policy. It's never been done, so we don't know. There's yeah. certain theoretical procedures that are, are suggested to do this, but the bottom line is, in essence, they're pretty much the same thing. Mm. The bottom line and the reason for uploading it in, through the lens of transhumanism and longevity as well as whole brain emulation is to store the brain, to back up the brain. Mm. Why? Because the brain is vulnerable because it contains our mind without our brain. What's the point of being here? You can't just be a body. You have to be a person. Mm -hmm. And we are people where our species is comprised of human beings as, as people. Mm -hmm. And to be a person, you have to have identity and to continue living over time, no matter what substrate you exist within or on, you need that continuity of your personhood or your identity. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you have fractured identity or what we would call in our biological sense, schizophrenia or psychosis. Wow, well, this is another reason why I do these um, videos. It's like a journal for me. This is my way of backing myself up. But um, I know <laughs> there's other ways to do that. I know Martine Rothblatt has um, a mind, mind files she talks about doing that, having a, backing your brain in these mind files and stuff like that, which I thought was really interesting. Um, wow, we touched on a lot of stuff today. I want to really thank you. Is um, what books can you do you recommend for people who just who are new to transhumanism and doesn't have a lot of um uh 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 they don't have a, a lot of they're not they haven't been exposed to it that much. They're just learning about it. They just got into it. They heard it from somewhere and they want to know more. Yeah. It's, uh, let me put it right in front of you. Very, very simple. It's very simple. 
Okay. And back and from Ray Kurzweil. This is what Ray says. Mm. I know that you admire Ray. Oh, and, definitely. And, yeah. Yeah. It says, Natasha Vita Moore is a very engaging, highly regarded and dramatic speaker, writer and thinker on issues of transhumanism, life extension, artificial intelligence and its impact on society and other topics that I also have a strong interest in. I've known her for decades and have been inspired by her insights. Wow. Okay. I'm going to get it. Yeah, it's 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 short. It's sweet. I, mm -hmm. I wrote it uh, just to be simple. So that book I would recommend first. Mm. Um, the Transhumanist Reader, the book that you mentioned early on in our, our discussion, um, is more academic, but you have 72 authors in it. And these authors are the primary thinkers in their respective fields. So you have, yeah, that book. You have um, Robin Hanson talking about economics. You have Werner Vinge talking about uh, technological singularity. You have a debate between Max Moore and Ray Kurzweil about singularity, Martin Rothblatt, who we mentioned, Marvin Minsky about AI, Ben Gertzwell on AI. So you have um, Eric Drexler on nanotechnology, the mm. early philosophy, the ideas, my work in Primo Posthuman is mentioned in it. So mm. it's, it's a really good resource. So those are the two books I would recommend. The other thing I would recommend is to go to transhumaniststudies.com or transhumaniststudies.org. It launches in, uh, I think, February. So it, necessary. Uh, yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> so necessary. Like, <laughs> what do you do? Yeah, I have very students necessary right now. from all over the world constantly emailing me who are working on their master's degrees, their doctorate degree. Wow. I had a postdoctorate uh, recently, uh, un uh, undergrad, just a bachelor's, which is great, uh, high school mm. students emailing me, asking me for advice to help them and if I would read their work, if I could give them comments. And I love doing it. So I'm no longer full-time faculty anymore. So I have, I thought, what am I going to do next? And I thought I'm going to make a, a documentary on longevity. Mm. And I would love you to be a part of it. Oh, yeah. And it's going to be some behind the scenes information. Wow. And it's going to have some of the early days, you know, discussions with Roy Walford and, um, and of course, wow. um, FM 2030, but also mention of Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw uh, looking oh, at, you know, yeah, cryonics, um, the earliest, uh, the, the movement, how it started. And we do have a life extension movement today. And it started largely through transhumanism. Because if you think about in the 1980s, Dirk and Sandy were around, where Wolf was around, mm -hmm. FM was around. Um, but who else was really talking about life extension? <laughs> so FM introduced me to it and then I started talking about it. So, um, but if you look at in the 1990s, the conferences that we held through XRP Institute in uh, Los Angeles, Silicon Valley, um, uh, and then Transvision conferences in, in uh, Sweden and Belgium, France, uh, Germany, Italy, all these conferences, the the core underlining theme is, of course, life extension. Right. Then we oh. talked about the technologies and the sciences on top of that, but it has always been life extension. In fact, the philosophy of transhumanism is fundamentally about longevity, life extension, how to stay alive. Then the philosophical practice is about that, how to stay alive, how to stay informed, and then looking at the sciences and technologies, and there's no other worldview or movement that has ever done that. Right. And it's, it's so lovely to see all the people that have contributed to this movement, but then you have artificial intelligence over here and how AI is helping organize the material, the data that, and then of course, nanotechnology, nanomedicine is going to be a major breakthrough for longevity life extension. So we've been covering these topics at our conferences wow. uh, going back to the you know, 1990s and on my TV show in the 1980s. So, and it's all within transhumanism. So I think that looking at this worldview is not just about living longer, it's also about education. It's yeah. about how to be informed about the technologies. Mm. What could go right? What could go okay? Mm. What could go wrong? And then you bring in existential risk. So mm. we need to be aware of the risks mm. of any of these technologies in mitigating disease and extending life.
So I know Nick Brostrom talks about um existential risk and the the pearls of what can go wrong and what can you know go go right. He to- I know yeah. he talks about that a lot. Yeah, that is his area of expertise mm-hmm. um, within the domain of transhumanism. And of course, uh, at Oxford University at the Future of Humanity Institute, mm-hmm. he has been a, a pioneer in thinking about existential risk. And he and Andrew Sandberg together, and Andrews, as you know, is, is um, an advisor to Humanity Plus and has been a longtime transhumanist. Mm-hmm. And I think it was Andrews who introduced transhumanism to uh, Nick years mm. ago, and Nick came to Los Angeles to meet with Max and I after we had put on several conferences. Mm. And um, so I think that he really wow. contributed to transhumanism through his work on existential risk and looking at AI. Extra P Institute. Tell us about that. Your experience at the Extra P Institute, because mm. that's, that's really important when, when it comes to the history of transhumanism. I, and I, I want people to know about it. Yeah. Extropy Institute was founded by Max Moore and Tom Bell in 1990, and its purpose was to create a platform to spread transhumanist ideas and to delve deeply into the technologies of the future and to apply critical thinking. It held conferences throughout the 1990s, uh, and our last conference was 2004, where we came up with a proactionary principle. The first conferences were uh, held in Los Angeles and Silicon Valley. And um, the, the focus was always on life extension and AI nanotechnology. Ray Kurzweil was our keynote on more than one occasion mm. early on before he became as exceedingly famous as he is today. Uh-huh. And he's been a dear supporter and dear friend mm. for eons, Martin Rothblatt as well. XGP Institute created the first email list on the web, which is now the internet, on the future, looking at life extension, technology, and science. And that started in 1991, I believe it was. And again, this is, remember, we didn't have the internet back then. We had the web and we had the dial-up. Yeah. But it was called Extropy was the email list. And you had Mm. some of the most remarkable minds and thinkers on that list who were discussing everything that's taking place today wow. and and what could happen. Some of it hasn't taken place and other things have taken place instead, but it's all mm-hmm. good stuff. So that was really exciting. Extra Institute published a high gloss magazine that was at bookstores. You could find it at like, um, I can't remember all the bookstores now. What wow. were they called? Well, you worked in a bookstore. So yeah. you, you know, like, we probably even had it. We probably had it. You probably overlooked. had it. It's a high gloss magazine. It was gorgeous, mm-hmm. beautifully designed. And yeah, it sold at bookstores wow. uh, throughout the country and um, very smart articles. Those articles can be found online. Yeah, so, Extra Institute. Yeah. yeah, I need to it go was, back and do my research on that. Extra Institute, nothing has compared. Um, World yeah, Transhumanist Association <laughs> tried. It um, got too political, had to. Um, uh, rebrand as Humanity Plus. And Plus. since I've been involved in Humanity Plus, I've tried to bring in um, the um, a lot of the work done through XP Institute to balance mm-hmm. things out, to create a richer, more fluid, more informed um, nexus of information mm-hmm. for people to learn from. Uh, we talked about we closed down XP Institute in 2004 after the uh, summit the Vital Progress Summit. And that was the first online summit ever. And I chaired it and it was it was wonderful. Um, there's a little bit online about that, but again, um, we weren't thinking about how to self-promote ourselves. We were thinking about ideas. Right. And I, I'm still that way today. It's, it's um, I, I, I'm more interested in ideas and, and action. And uh, and we talked about this before. I'd rather five really smart, loving people uh, follow me than a million. Yeah, I totally agree. Have you heard of Alex Gray, the visionary artist? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. That? Did you see that? The, the, uh, you know, we used to sell his books too, but I, I, I was reading so much, I didn't really get to dove really deep into what he was doing. What, we had a whole artist section, and his books always stood out. But, um, yeah, as a performance artist, he had a unique um, 
handle on the psychedelic yeah. type of uh, self-help um, that was going on. Um, very visually um, like a kaleidoscope. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting formation, very much into chakras mm -hmm. and um, psychedelic um, otherness in um, existence and mm -hmm and um mental or spiritual uh, unity mm. across the cosmos uh yeah it's it's not my style it's, it's not my belief system but i, I right. certainly do value uh his contribution to the expanding consciousness and and visual appetite mm. of society because i he has a temple called Ethion. you know i look at it from a art a visual artist perspective i don't get you know, and uh, but just to, just his paintings alone. If you don't know anything about, you know, um, uh, any of his other work and why he's doing the work, if you just look at it just for its beauty, it's just magnificent. It's just that the Ethion Temple that he, I've never seen anything like that. And I brought that up because, you know, um, this where other places where we can gather outside of a conference, the lab and the university we need I, I maybe i'm wrong I, you know i'm a newbie i you know but what other places we i think we need other i think what you're going for is the 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 aesthetic mm. value of transformation right and i would say that a couple of examples uh outside a conference mm. where you're not there you're not spending you're not paying to be there Right. And I think that's the difference. I don't know if he charges people to go to his his mm. facility or not, or how much he charges, but mm. it can't have that essence mm. if you're paying hundreds or over a thousand dollars to to be there, right? Right. Well, I'm not. It, I'm. You know. I just. So I just, here's mm. okay. Biosphere. Mm. Biosphere in Tucson, uh, Roy Walford was there. He was the um, the medical scientist uh, in Biosphere. Mm. So Biosphere is really has this wonderful geodesic dome and That's and okay. vitality yeah, like to it. Yeah, okay, definitely. another yeah. another one. My favorite artist of all time, James Turrell, is to me does that. It it does what you're you're suggesting. It moves me. Uh, visually, uh, aesthetically, and emotionally to another place mm. where I I feel alive and and I feel vital. Mm. And so it's James Terrell. He in museums he does light installations. Mm. So if you walk into a room, you might see what you think is a doorway or a, a, a square hole in the wall or a circular hole in the wall, and you walk up and there's nothing there. Mm. He uses lights to transform the environment your surroundings mm. to be something other than it is mm. and it's it's majestic fun Education like a, fun. that's a, right the issue is everyone is charging so much money these days yeah. and wants to make so much money that the price is really high and i don't believe in charging a lot of money for education mm. yeah or for fun yes so las vegas i don't really care for too much yeah so outside of that it's convention centers or hotels mm. and then the question does it matter if we have two thousand people or 500. right right if we live stream it mm. we can have 500 mm. and people can participate around the world right. and share information so maybe if we were wise mm. and didn't worry about having thousands of people mm. and charging people thousands of dollars to attend mm. and have something quality and allow people to attend from anywhere, anytime. Mm. I think that may be the wave of the event. So, mm. yeah, I agree. We need more of them. And, it, and it's been hard to get together, too. Mm. I know when I was in Los Angeles, we would get together all the time all over L.A. Yeah. At, at different clubs. There after hours clubs. And it was yeah. lots of fun. Wow. It was great talking to you, uh, um, Dr. Natasha Vidamore. Thank you for all the gems you dropped, and it was a pleasure having you on. And I can go on and on and on and talk to you and and, and about all types of history and all the stuff that you, the the journey you um, walked through, It's definitely inspiring. I enjoyed it, and I I definitely enjoy all your contributions 
to the transhumanist um philosophy just the transhumanist movement um i definitely benefited from transhumanism it's definitely helped me uh, tremendously so i appreciate you do you want to um say anything to the audience before we head out and shout out to max moore by the way peace max thank you (laughs) i would what i'd like to to say is for goodness sakes you know Let's just find some joy and share yeah. and and appreciate yeah. everything that we have That's and appreciate right. every moment of being alive. Yeah. And for you, my friend, thank you for your humility and your loveliness. You. Uh, it's pleasant, enjoyable, and your kindness only reverberates more kindness and sharing. So thank you. Thank you very much. And we out, Dr. Natasha Vidamore. Peace.